Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Hidden Levers War Room for the end of May 2018. Today we'll be uh, talking about the topic of inflation, sweating inflation. Are you? Perhaps your clients are. It is time to do that, so we're going to talk about it. I'm joined by my co-founder here at Hidden Levers, Praveen Gunta. My name is Raj Udeshi. Thanks for joining us, customers or not. We love that you like macro. Here we go. The War Room, uh, if you've never been here, is about how we update our scenarios on Hidden Levers. Hidden Levers scenarios are what power the platform. Uh, we'll give you good ideas on um, on where to invest and macro generation, uh, macro topic uh, coverage. So this is how to use Hidden Levers in context. Uh, today we'll, we'll give you a five minute rundown and uh, then talk about inflation. Uh, first examine where the pricing pressures are and talk about this concept of symmetric inflation that the Fed keeps dropping uh, and what that means. You know, perhaps your clients are asking you about what that means. Uh, and so, and then we'll cover uh, the scenarios, the two scenarios to update today, inflation and oil prices, which are almost a new scenario, not really an update. Uh, it's not just a generic single factor shock or spike. It's really uh, contemplating geopolitical uh, ramifications. So stay with us here. You're in for a lot. All right. Well, let's start with the skinny rod, which really gets to why this uh, why this scenario is relevant. Yeah. Well, let's face it. Uh, you know, if you look at the headlines, you're kind of uninformed because they're they're using monthly CPI numbers. If you look at the website of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, the ones calculating this stuff, the real thing that matters is annual CPI, and we're well above two on that. The Fed knows that. And that's what they're looking at. But for some reason, the headlines and the financial media always concentrate on that number, sometimes the executive as well. Uh, so CPI is well above 2% now, and oil touched $80, although it's careened off that. So those are big reasons why inflation is, is a, a, a topic for us. Uh, wages rising, you know, you can see that perhaps with your own employees. We know that it is with ours, uh, and and that is contributing to inflation. Uh, but the main thing that made this ripe was that the Fed, the new Fed chief, and uh, his his kind of colleagues, they're all okay with CPI above two. They don't, they're not bothered at all, and and they're going to continue on a, a certain path. They're they're not too bothered as, uh, and and don't care that it was just the target stopping here. Praveen, anything to say about that? Right. You know, and it's, you know, it's worth noting that, of course, the Fed looks at a slightly different tracker of inflation called the PCE index or the, the price change of that personal consumption expenditures index. It basically tracks CPI, though. It's a little bit lower than CPI, but it, they effectively move together. And uh, but they said in their most recent minutes, and that's something that we'll talk about more, uh, that they are comfortable with with even their own indicator running above two percent. So, and that's that's sort of a new a new statement, um, despite the plans to continue to have multiple rate hikes uh, uh, likely this year. That they've indicated more willingness than we've seen before around that. All right. Well, let's start actually by uh, taking a look at uh, hidden levers, and specifically, Raj, you had mentioned this idea of. Um, if I jump in two hidden levers, but this idea of what economic data in terms of inflation really matters. And we just want to take a quick look in our economic data center. So if I jump into the economic data center and I jump in under the economy tab, you can actually see it right here. There's the monthly CPI number, which is annualized, uh, sort of in the, in the headline numbers that you oftentimes see in the media. And the problem here is you can see how noisy this data is. So this is the monthly CPI number. You can see how noisy it is. What happens is that they use certain um, formulas to first seasonally adjust it. And unfortunately, those formulas have become uh, less and less uh, reliable over time. They've been struggling to get the seasonal adjustments right. You can kind of see how the end of the first quarter, you know, the last couple of years magically drops. And you wonder, like, okay, is that real or is that an artifact? And, and it's seeming more and more like a lot of these strongly negative winter numbers are just bad seasonal adjustments. So what we look at instead of looking at the monthly number, which is the headline number, is we look at a simple year-over-year -year CPI. So this is asking the question, well, how much did prices rise from the same month the prior year? And that's naturally seasonally adjusted because you compare December to the previous December and you compare July to the previous July. And so you naturally get that, that um, 
accounted for. And what we see in these numbers is that inflation hit a low point, a post-recession uh, low point in early 2015, and it's been this steady climb upward. And so really, this is why we felt it was time to, to address this topic. Here we are coming up on 2.5% and uh, with, with a steady climb over the last three years. That, that certainly makes it ripe. And just want to, you know, in the future, when, when you look at inflation numbers or you're hearing about it in the media, make sure to look at, okay, but what was the change since last year? Not that seasonally adjusted number that, that as we just showed, is, is very noisy and, and frankly not, not terribly accurate. All right, Thank let's jump back in now. Well, so that's one of our takeaways. If you only have five minutes for us because the world is so busy, uh, just remember that annual inflation numbers from us or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where exactly where we get it, is much more reliable for you in terms of actually gauging inflation and whether to be worried or not. Uh, look at us, not the media monthlies. That's just there to sell more papers. Um, okay, so the other pieces, if you if you only have a few minutes, is that the economy is being, uh, as the Fed is running it, it's running hot rather than uh, rather than taming inflation uh, right now, right away clobbering it. Uh, the reason is because uh, to, to make up for all that, um, the labor force participation, that low labor force participation is uh, what they want. They want to hire that. You know, they want to really decrease unemployment. Again, not just headline numbers, but burn off that excess unemployment, get people back in the workforce, etc. cetera. Uh, the other pieces here, if you, you know, as we'll get into it, CPI's rise is driven mostly by energy, somewhat by housing, um, and uh, you know, rising housing; those things do matter uh, to to the most out of any uh, of our of our inflation gauges. And Praveen, do you want to talk about uh, how our scenarios right now are actually in motion, as opposed to uh, not started yet? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a good point. Usually, when we build out new scenarios, uh, it's all forward-looking. As we were reviewing it, uh, you know, and putting these scenarios together, both on the oil front and on the inflation front, sort of the the baseline, the kind of in between in our sort of, we, we usually do either like a good, bad, ugly, or a good baseline, ugly type of, uh, you know, looking at different multiple outcomes for any particular scenario. And we're, we're, we kind of see that in both of those cases, the midline scenario really is already in motion, whether you talk about inflation and the fact that we're, all, we're over the um, Fed's inflation target, but they're content with that for the moment. And then uh, on the oil side, that uh, we've settled into sort of this uh, hopefully Goldilocks range where we're uh, not too high or not too low. So in right. both cases. But those ranges, Praveen, have uh, inevitable impacts right now that affect the S&P, the GDP, et cetera. And so those scenarios haven't completely uh, played out. And so we're covering right. them even midstream. It also goes to show, you know, the, uh, the macro picture is very nuanced this year and kind of in the driver's seat again, as opposed to any just uh, endless endless rally from last year. Right, when particular as, you know, inflation is of course one of the drivers of, of rate hikes, and now we see the Fed starting to act, and uh, and so the questions around that, of course, are going to drive markets. I don't well, think start we've talking. ever had more scenarios in motion than right now. Yeah, you know, it, 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 and it's interesting too, because in, in from a hidden levers and a scenario modeling standpoint, we've talked about this internally, the fact that there are scenarios in motion. We, over the years, we've looked at many different um, scenarios, lots of potential downsides, potential risks, and we pride ourselves on looking at that, but also looking at upsides and potentially benign scenarios. And, and at least right now, we're not yet in uh, the, you know, the downside of the business cycle or anything like that. And so, you know, it's key to look at those as well, which is something that we're, we're going to do today. Yeah, but let's start. Let's start with talking about inflation and pricing pressures. And so let's let's zoom out, if you will, or, or maybe even just backwards in time and look at the long term. Uh, how long is long term, a, Praveen? How long is this uh, cover this chart over here? Well, so this chart. So so here, let's the, we're looking at 150 years, uh, and this is courtesy Advisor Perspectives. Doug Short over there does some great analysis, and 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 their team in terms of looking at some of these long term economic trends. Um, 150 years of inflation data stitched together between the official CPI and some earlier metrics 
Um, and what you can see, what's interesting, uh, if you look at this chart, and it's pretty clear, back before the Federal Reserve really became active in terms of its control over inflation and, and how the economy runs, we used to see almost equal periods of inflation and deflation. And this is this incidentally is one of the reasons that the you know the, the Fed you know its power has increased over time. There was this attempt to stop having these red periods. These red periods include things like the Great Depression, and uh, to sort of reduce the volatility in the economy that that creates. So post-war, what happened was that so if you take the whole time frame, two and a half percent is the long-term average of inflation. But if you take just the post-war period, because the deflationary periods were eliminated, so just start, you know, from here, World War II, or just after World War II, then you actually see it's more like 3.8%. And of course, that includes these oil shocks right here. Uh, but then if you look at the last decade, actually, inflation has been pretty darn low, uh, 1.6%. And, and so... This is some of the context, the 10-year average of inflation being at 1.6%. That's some of the context for why maybe the Fed is willing to let us run hot a little bit right now. In effect, over the last 10 years, the economy hasn't, prices haven't risen as fast as their overall target. So they essentially feel like maybe they have some slack in that target right now. And that, for the first time, is, is you know, we're starting to hear conversations around that. But anyway, just for context as we move forward, 2.5% is this super long 150-year average. And, and then lately, if you want to look at another number, 1.6 is where we've been in the last decade. All right. So having said that, now we zoom in a little closer into recent, the recent time frame. What's driving inflation today? So this chart at the top right is straight from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, one year changes. So you can see that energy is the dominant factor in terms of over the last year, what's been driving in terms of this simple breakdown, what's been driving prices. Not so, hard to see it from that table. I mean, even energy is what making is what making uh, transportation services also more expensive. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. And so you see, yeah, two of the components here are essentially transportation related, you know, actual energy, which is predominantly gasoline prices and diesel prices, uh, and, and then transportation services, which are layered on top of that. So those two are being driven by these costs. And then the other big one I just wanted to call out, which I thought was interesting, because it's such a large chunk of CPI, because rent or um, mortgage payments are uh, one of the largest expenses that, that Americans have. So this 3.4% here, which is, of course, above the average rate of inflation, so it's bringing things up, that is a large part of that is actually coming from um, what's called imputed rent. So basically how much you would be willing to rent your own house for if you own it or someone else might be willing to rent your house for. And that's driven in no small part by the price of your house. And so as home prices rise, that actually drives inflation as well, not surprisingly, and that's how it figures into the equation. So, so really those are the two factors. This, this stuff at the top is energy. And then this third one, this is home prices. And that's really overall what's driving, driving inflation today. And we can see that in this chart the top left, home prices have been steadily moving upward since the recession, and uh, CPI really started kicking up thereafter, uh, after bottoming in um, in 2015, but, but now those trends are kind of moving in parallel. We did have a question, or I guess we had a couple of comments. One was uh, with respect to um, a landscaping business and just comments about folks having trouble. I guess if, if any of you have clients, you know, that, that actually are exposed to those hourly labor prices, well, it sounds like some of those clients are having trouble finding laborers. The, um, the other, you know, interesting question in terms of um, health care. And when we were looking at this, I, in fact, before we started to make this slide and do this research, my knee-jerk reaction was that, oh, yeah, we need to look at health care inflation. So what's interesting about that number not being as high as you might expect is that hospital prices uh, are up like four and a half percent year on year, so it is a driver of inflation. But uh, physician services are up uh, a very low amount; it was less than one percent, so it averaged out. Uh, pharmaceuticals, you would think, would be driving this more. We all know how fast pharma prices have been moving. Um, they seem to fall into a very like a generic bucket within the breakdowns. So it's kind of hard to, to see them kind of unpacked from everything else. But um, and actually commodities, just to be clear, commodities in the CPI does not mean like raw aluminum or things like that, because the CPI is about what consumers buy. 
So commodities is literally just stuff you buy for your house that isn't food or energy. So it's actually like retail goods, including apparel, for instance. Uh, it, it's a broad range and prices there are, are, are slightly lower. Um, even, I believe even cars, like so, so vehicles, new, new car purchases, that's a major component of what's called commodities here in the CPI. It's, it's sort of a little different. Than you might expect. I mean, we, we have a uh, we have healthcare inflation as a lever, don't we? Do we want to show that to show that uh, we you know, actually we do yeah we... briefly to break it out yeah so and it's interesting because it, it you, you see different breakdowns but yeah let's look at it really quick if I go into the industry levers we can see healthcare spending growth and healthcare inflation and uh, and you can see 2.25 percent on the most recent reading for Q2 of 2018 so. Um, you know, and then the other tracker, which is coming from from a different uh, governmental survey, is a How bit about higher. That chart is, but is, neither. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. Neither of these actually seem as high as we kind of may may feel they are. So here's healthcare inflation, and it helps yeah. actually to get the context of the super long term uh, to an extent. But you can see that, and if I go back to the decade, you can see that at various points, even in the past decade, healthcare inflation has actually been a lot higher, and it seems to have muted again just over the course of the last really six months or so. After and notice that that bit. trend has happened contemporaneously with the overall inflation uh, absence, right? While, while they've been, while we haven't even been close to inflation targets overall on CPI for the past uh, 10 years, uh, in healthcare inflation is its own beast, kind of unconnected to the major picture. If it's muted or it's even in the two handles now, that's a total coincidence, you know, so don't, I would have divorced right. healthcare inflation from inflation overall. Yeah, so yeah, and, and it's true. We just got a comment about, and, and it is true that healthcare inflation and meta, and sorry, t and tuition are major components. Tuition is a tricky one too, and you know, honestly, we'd have to go back and look to see exactly how they account for it. Partly though, because the and actually healthcare, so both healthcare and and education suffer from a, a similar problem here in terms of how you account for it. The top line numbers on both, so whether it's drug prices, whether it's hospital charge rates, whether it's the sticker tuition at a four-year college, all of those rise at a fairly high clip in sometimes in the high single digits per year, if not higher in some cases. But the actual cost charged to the end user doesn't necessarily rise nearly as fast because of in both of those cases, you have really weird payment systems where there's third parties involved, where there's, uh, in the case of education, there's borrowing involved. There, there's, there's sort of these other factors that, that may um, make it a little more difficult to account for. But uh, anyway, this is the breakdown of the numbers as, as reported. And, you know, interesting, I mean, the basic point we see here is that energy is driving the bus in terms of these numbers. And with that, Raj, do you want to talk a little bit about energy and, and oil in particular and what you see there? We want to take a little bit of a deep dive into oil prices and what's happened. You know, there's been uh, definitely uh, chicken littles uh, talking about oil prices skyrocketing, $100 oil again, all that stuff. So, you know, and we, we've got a bit of geopolitical news around what caused that. And so if you look there since the start of the year, there's the breakdown. You know, Venezuela, talk of being a failed state, definitely a collapse of its oil industry. And there's that. Meantime, the United States, uh, you know, that uh, is has been building it through through shale. We've talked about that over the past few years, uh, you know, and even on the blog uh, where USA is a, not a net exporter yet, but it's become the number two exporter in the world uh, of oil. And so or, sorry, number two producer, I should say. Um, you know, it's picking up its exports. It's looking for new markets, just like any salesperson. And so guess what? Uh, you know, now that Venezuela has uh, bit the bullet, then U.S. can step in there. And so it took it a little while, uh, took a, a little while to get those um, deals going. But, you know, the U.S. is supplier uh, and exporting to all of old Venezuela's old customers takes oil back up. And so, but you can see these pops on oil. They're nothing like the month long things during the Arab Spring or uh, anything during that long lull uh, during uh, the, the financial crisis, you know, where we had uh, real max drawdowns on 
uh, historic max drawdowns on oil prices. These are just normal fundamentals of the oil industry pops, you know, uh, short lived and not really mostly noise for a long term investor or uh, and not too much a reason even to celebrate uh, uh, oil, uh, oil companies uh, daily pop. Now, forget about that. What's really important is that there's this sweet spot somewhere between 60 bucks and 80 bucks. Uh, you know, our lines could be better on there. Uh, but that in that in that sweet spot is where producers and uh, consumers are both happy about oil prices. Right. And there's normal growth going on. So basically between 60 and 80 ish, you know, in somewhere between 60 and 70, somewhere in there, oil is a non issue. Right. For the economy's growth. And so that's what, one of the most important things that comes from this. Also, whatever. You know this Iran sanctions news for whatever it is the the long the long term is a really interesting picture that I, we don't find anybody talking about you know so who are Iran's customers for oil it is India and China right we know that because the when the Iran sanctions were there uh, Iran uh, India and China as uh, emerging economic powers were just completely defying any sanctions and just buying that Iranian oil you know. Um, they just right, they didn't take part. in defiance. And so, you know, they're Iran's biggest customers and their agenda is uh, economic growth too, oil powered industrial growth. And so as as that happens, they don't they they need that oil come hell or high water. And so if there's economic sanctions, you know, you'll see some sort of pop. We think it'll be pretty short lived because that's what this market seems to be doing with all its um, macro news in, in 2018. Right. And so if there is that, if it if it hasn't already been priced in, well, guess what? That's actually in America's economic benefit in the long term. The irony of that, you know, maybe it may not be in our political benefit. Who knows? It may it may disrupt a, a global harmony. But in terms of long term benefit, we become we, the same way we've uh, the United States has stepped into Venezuela's shoes to sell oil to its old customers. Well, guess what? Since Iran uh, can't sell oil. You know, maybe the U.S. underprices, whatever it has to do, but it picks up China. I think, Praveen, we were talking about China already being a, a U.S. oil customer. Isn't that right? Well, it was, it, I mean, in terms of world trade news, the, the deal that I guess still under discussion with the, um, with the U.S. administration and with China is to, is to have China buy more U.S. oil. Now, I mean, it, the one thing that we should note is that, of course, oil to a certain extent is a fungible commodity, meaning that if you don't buy your oil from person A, you buy it from or country A, you buy it from country B. And, and it, it's not all exactly the same in terms of what refineries can produce, can refine which oil, but it's all pretty much the same. The end products are the same. You still want gasoline, you still want diesel, et cetera. And so um, generally speaking, most oil eventually makes its way to world markets, except in Venezuela is an interesting example, when a country falls apart. So Venezuela is, you know, borderline failed state at this point. So their production has collapsed. When Libya failed a number of years ago, uh, their production collapsed. It's almost, it's like a pretty good tell that an emerging market is collapsing. If the thing that is most valuable in their country, they can't, they don't have it together enough to sell that thing. Well, then they're in bad shape. And so that's certainly where Venezuela is now. Um, Iran, it's unclear. Like if, if the sanctions bite for them, what, where the sanctions really bite, it's, it's you know, to your point, Raj, China and India are buying the oil anyway, but longer term what happens is that like, for instance, a lot of European companies were getting into Iran to help them modernize their oil production. So that does, if that stops happening, then their production goes down because they don't have modern oil field equipment. They don't do horizontal drilling like, you know, we do here. They don't do fracking. Like they don't have any of the modern capabilities. So uh, that actually has an impact and that would be an, an impact that would actually uh, have a long-term effect. And then as the U.S., we keep on getting better at this stuff, our production continues to rise while theirs doesn't. Okay. Well, the the main thing is, you know, on the upside of that is at some point, if, if China has agreed to buy more U.S. oil, then maybe, you know, to, to not deal with the political fallout of buying Iranian oil, India does the same. And so you can see, you can envision a long-term scenario where the U.S. could become the world's number one oil exporter. You know, the oil prices scenario image um, that you notice on our site is, is still a crying Arab sheik. And so that kind of Saudi sadness is an inevitability, right? Here, you know, to the small Iran is small potatoes compared to that. But you can see an upside scenario now, long term, where U.S. becomes uh, the driver's seat 
in the driver's seat for oil prices and oil exportation, right? And even in right. the emerging powers, if they are, if those GDPs do eclipse America ever, um, you know, the a, a sphere of influence there is controlling their oil supply. So right. Well, and to be clear, you know, it's about us buying less from those countries too, because we still buy about half of our oil um, from overseas. And so if that percentage drops, it, it accomplishes the same thing uh, in terms of changing the balance of power in, in oil markets. If we're producing 75% of our own oil, well, then that means that's, that's 5 million barrels a day we're not buying from world markets. So, um, so yeah, so, so, so that change will, will matter regardless of, of, uh, of exportation versus just becoming the world's number one producer, which we are actually very close to that point again. And we've not been the world's number one producer for something like 40 years, uh, actually almost 50 years. Early and, 60s, uh, I think. Yeah, we might take that title again. Well, so just to speak about other commodities, though, um, you know, and, and kind of get that broader view, uh, tracking along with oil, aluminum and copper and other industrial metals have been moving up, and we see that pretty clearly at the top left. Whereas precious metals, relatively flat over, and this is all over a two-year time frame. And then finally, agricultural commodities, which this might seem, um, this was interesting because it might seem um, surprising to anyone who's sort of like, you go to the grocery store, um, you feel like, you know, prices are rising, but you don't buy metric tons of corn, do you, right? And so when you look at it at the raw commodity level, in fact, uh, even U.S. farmers are complaining that agricultural commodity prices are down, and that is true over the last couple of years. Down pretty significantly, if the index was at 130, and now it's below 110, that's a, you know, this is a 13.8% two-year drop. Uh, so that's substantial, but then the prices that we see at the store, of course, are final product prices, which are going to be um, much more part of just the overall consumer staples, um, you know, that, that sector, and, and all the prices that get layered on top of it. Um, so yeah, those, so, those so actually might be price, middleman then, stories, yeah. right, Praveen? I mean, there you have to deal with um, uh, middleman either taking taking the mar higher margins there, overcharging customers because uh, they're not used to that deflationary trend, uh, or or you have their own rent going up. Uh, you know, we talked about housing prices right. and all that contributing and labor, inflation and, kind of and yep. labor. So if their if their costs, let's say for a grocery store, are going up on both labor and rent, then they're passing that on. With higher prices, right? So that's what so that's, a, that's why you can have contemporaneous costs going up at the grocery store, but agricultural commodities going down. Right. That's the only you know, really the if the precious metals are flat, that's the only one that's dropping rapidly, and you know, and then really the copper and aluminum, that's really just correlated with the where we are in the business cycle. You know, with the expansion, both of these metals are heavily used in construction, so so that shouldn't be terribly surprising that they'd be moving up along with the economy. All right, one last look at sort of inflation big picture, and that would be the global view. Apologies for the terrible looking chart. The CIA World Factbook actually had the most recent data on this, but uh, I don't know where they get their chart colors from. Anyway, you can see that. Um, that's called the, LSD, Praveen. Yeah, that, that must be what that is. So almost all of the colors in the chart, The only so I, I can almost do this by inverse. The only countries that are 2% or below are basically the dark blues. So you've got some of Europe, you've got Canada and China, and then a handful of countries in the emerging markets like in Africa. But the great majority of company, uh, countries now are greater than 2%, including the United States and Australia and many others. And then you've got in the green, 5% and up, and the yellow, 10%, and increasingly a number of red and then hot pink countries, which are experiencing... Um, in some cases, something that's almost hyperinflation. In terms of countries that are not failed states and do have access to world markets, two that come to mind are Turkey and Argentina. You know, so both kind of emerging markets, but not totally undeveloped by any means. And yet both of them are experiencing inflation in the 40% range right now, um, or, you know, certainly as this chart depicts greater than 25. So, uh, we, we, you know, we are starting to see real inflation pressures crop up in other parts of the world. And, um, not so much in the developed economies, but, but it is starting to show up in parts of the EM. And, uh, and the question really becomes, is that, is that coming here next? Yeah, if, if you look at the parts of the world where there are young people producing things, right? USA is right there. India's population, I believe half is under 30. Uh, very young population in South America, very young population in 
um, Australia is pretty mixed, just like us, but uh, you know, very, a lot of young people. There, you see some inflation in the healthy economy, right? Look at the where the blue is. It's in Europe and and Japan, especially the you know the other where there's those, those deflationary pressures are because of population, and in Canada, it seems the same way. Definitely. And just to follow up before we move on, we have um, we grabbed some links on actually the tuition breakdown within the official CPI number. So we'll be posting those uh, in the questions chat for those who are interested. All right. Well, let's move to now. You know, we've been talking about the that was the big picture on inflation and inflationary pressures that's coming from commodities markets and, and elsewhere. The now this question of you know a new term from the Federal Reserve, right, Raj? This idea of symmetric inflation. Uh, let's talk about that, and and really this is kind of getting into how the Fed decides to respond to the inflation that it sees. Right. Well, we've uh, we've had a lot of talk about um, the new. You know, last month we actually covered uh, the hawkish tone of the new Fed, and so why would they just let things go? You know, why don't why don't they care that much about inflation? Why are they just um, kind of in a Zen moment instead of instead of tackling this not in, that non-existent inflationary beast, you know, why, why? And so symmetric inflation was what they kind of put to the world in all their minutes, et cetera. And we're left to decipher what that means. And so there's been a lot of talk. And so, you know, you may be getting asked questions from your clients. Uh, and so here we are to break that down in a simple way uh, that doesn't, that talks at their level, not above them. So main thing was that unemployment, what you know now is at an 18 year low but that's really one you know there's several gauges of unemployment and that is the headline unemployment if you look at the labor force participation rate you know it, it, it if you choose uh if you do, if you say you're not looking for a job you're not included in that unemployed group right so that true unemployment uh, you need to take into account labor force participation. And that's kind of been consistent with what we've been saying over the years. Now, though, since um, 2016, labor force participation has been increasing. That means more optimism about coming back into the job market looking for a job for these so-called structurally unemployed people. And so the Fed, you know, with its dual mandate of um, of unemployment and uh, inflation, right, to keep low inflation and maximize employment, um, they they've been trying to burn that off that extra unemployment that we don't see in the shadows right or just the labor statistics uh not necessarily the headlines and so as that that trend is rising they are very content to have wages be rising to have more optimism into um coming into the job market and so they're right, absolutely you know, that's not if they stop now then that can't happen you know it's kind of more like a pendulum you just can't uh if there is inertia to do it let it let it run out um all that yeah and, I, and raj like I, i'm like bringing kind of up this chart. Jobs. yeah i just want to look at sort of the longer term trend briefly here but um th this trend this rising trend in long-term labor force participation over the years that was actually due to women entering the workforce uh we got to this all-time high in terms of labor force participation with the dot-com bubble um, and since then, there was actually a long slide downward. So if you look at it, this is not actually a new thing, but since the great, if you want to just go back to right before the recession, 2008, we were at 66%. So really the bounce that you're seeing in our other slide is literally just this bounce from 62.4 up to near 63. So we're literally just starting to crawl off the bottom on this number. Um, because the, the way this is measured, uh, the aging of the baby boomers, will tend to drag labor force participation down. So there's some natural reasons that maybe it's going to come down a little bit, but, but still, this has been a, a you know, long standing area of concern that you'd want to see this bounce back, if not to the levels prior to the crisis, at least to something in between. You know, not all of these folks are folks that are retiring for good. There are definitely folks in here still uh, that uh, can't find work and would if, um, if it were available. So. So that's, that's sort of the bigger context for that. But that, you know, that's a reason to continue driving inflation from the standpoint of the Fed, right, to, to try to continue to, to soak that up. And, and that's where you start to see that in the, in the wage growth as well, right, is that as, um, as labor force participation is rising, but also as unemployment, and if we think about maybe from this standpoint, we can think about the unemployment number is measuring People who have been engaged in the workforce who aren't structurally unemployed, what's their employment rate or unemployment rate? Uh, 
And so for those folks, because this is getting low, we're starting to see median wages grow. Um, it's still that next step to try to pull the folks that really haven't been there back into the um, back into the workforce. So that is why you have a Fed who is more hawkish, still be fine with inflation and still not raise rates kind of, you know, uh, with their finger on the trigger if needed, but not pulling that trigger at all on hiring rates. Um, you know, even if they've made projections that they will do it, content to let inflation ride right now because labor force participation is growing. You see a big picture of frozen meat right there and kind of the definition of symmetric that's the most basic words of that are right highlighted in red. You know, if we had that prolonged below target inflation rate, we don't mind hanging out a little bit above the target inflation rate or a lot above it for a while because that is symmetry, right? That creating symmetry. And so the reason we put a giant piece of frozen meat on there is to kind of that that's more. It's just the way the world works. Right. If you have a if you have a frozen piece of meat, it's a lot takes a lot longer to thaw out or to heat up and a lot more energy on it uh, than a, just a cold piece of meat or just, you know, fresh meat. So just think of it that way. Right. If we that the the economy is that piece of meat, basically frozen or unemployment, I should say you know, frozen and now finally thawing. So you're going to let it go. Right. We got an interesting question, uh, which I just was, was answering uh, w with respect to financial planning software and assumptions about what kind of inflation assumption to use for the long term. And apparently the software in question actually has the assumption at 3.8% versus looking at a shorter time frame. The last 30 years and the average has actually been much lower, closer to the 2.5% that, that you and I had just mentioned, Raj. And then, of course, if you look at the last 10 years, you would get an even lower assumption. But uh, I, I think in part, as we'll see when we look at the scenarios in a, in a moment here, um, having a, a long-term inflation assumption over 4%, well, we have to ask ourselves, like, okay, what would cause that to be the case? Even in, even in the financial planning software's um, data, why would, why would that come up? Well, one reason is that that huge inflation pulse in the late 70s and early 80s. So to really believe in a story, and I'm not saying that one shouldn't, but to really believe in a story of four or five percent inflation long term, you prob that probably implies that you believe that there is another commodity shock of some kind coming along, because that's really where those big big pulses of inflation have come from in past U.S. history. Uh, and as we've just been talking about the oil market, because the U.S. is becoming such a substantial producer because the technologies available to extract oil have improved, uh, it, it seems less likely to really be able to sustain that. Is it possible? And we're going to talk about, and we are talking about how the economy is running a little bit hot right now, but it's one thing to say that the economy is running a little bit hot. And it's another thing to say that, oh, we're going to be at four and 5% for, you know, the entirety of a financial planning lifetime, like 30 yeah. years. So. A lot of, a lot of the advisors we deal with, you know, they're either boomers or on the border of being a boomer or Gen X. In either case, they remember certain uh, economic 101 topics like stagflation, high unemployment, and high uh, inflation contemporaneous. You know, those come from the Carter, Jimmy Carter era in which they grew up. Uh, and so they remember oil shocks leading to that, leading to political crisis in the Middle East, right? They're, that, that ain't happening now. It's not going to happen. You know, with the U.S. Uh, uh, as uh, the number two producer of oil now, it's just a coal. It's a whole different ball game. You know, it's almost like the. It's just that all that would all that politics from the late 70s would be totally unnecessary now. We can just isolate ourselves and deal with our own oil, or maybe just between us and Canada. That's that's that is a lot of um, clout to to wield around, and so it. You know, those those inflationary shocks from that just can't happen. So, you know, internally we discussed actually where should we put stagflation because that is, I guess that is a black swan of some sort, you know, so we've chosen to put it in historical scenarios where it belongs, you know, but any, any advisor now uh, in my book talking or financial professional or asset manager, anybody talking about stagflation, they're, they're kind of, you know, that's like talking about welcome back Cotter. You, you're just talking about mm -hmm. a relic relic of the past that is irrelevant now yeah the you know it, one last note on that on this topic and the question of like what inflation assumption is a reasonable one to use um you know in rolling out we've just started to roll out you know really beta version or early version of some cash flow uh type functionality within hidden levers 
and the, the, the starting point assumption that we are using is 2.5%. So that, that kind of is, is more, that thinking is more in line with, you know, and again, of course, as with all assumptions and hidden levers, you can change it. But, uh, but that's kind of where, if we had to make a baseline assumption, that's where it would be. Um, well, the other thing that we want to talk about here, though, uh, in terms of the Fed and Fed action and what the risks really are, is that, um, so we had mentioned this idea that the Fed uses a different inflation measurement, the PCE, uh, change in the PCE price index. And so it is actually lower than CPI and currently not above, not yet above their 2% threshold. But the fact that they've talked about this idea of symmetric inflation means they're probably going to let it rise above 2%. Um, and, and would be comfortable with that uh, before they get really aggressive with rate hikes. Now, uh, it's worth noting that within their inflation fighting toolkit, and this new Fed is, you know, perhaps a bit more hawkish, it seems, than let's say the last, the Yellen Fed, raising the Fed funds rate, that's a key uh, tool that they have and they're using. And most of, of like Wall Street has kind of priced in a 100% expectation of a rate hike in June. And then there's a 75% expectation of September. So it's actually right now, the market consensus is like two and a half rate hikes this year. It's no longer two rate hikes. So, you know, there's some, some, uh, not small number of financial market, uh, participants that think there's actually going to be a third rate hike this year. So, so, you know, it's not to say that they're not being hawkish at all, but really quickly, of course, everybody knows about raising the Fed funds rate to fight inflation. Shrinking of their balance sheet, that's often discussed in terms of uh, another way to uh, to lower the money supply and therefore to try to fight, you know, potential inflation. These other two are less well known, but the Fed also has the power to increase bank reserve requirements, which literally just means that banks have to hold more money uh, with the Fed and therefore they have less available to lend. And then finally, this is a, this is sort of a really esoteric one, but the Fed actually pays, and this started during the financial crisis, and they haven't stopped it yet, but the Fed actually pays banks when banks put money into their Federal Reserve account. So just like we might get interest from um, a savings account, banks get interest from the Fed for putting money in. And um, not only do they get money, uh, not only do they get interest from that, but they actually get a higher rate of interest uh, than uh, you or I would typically be able to get from the savings account. So one way the Fed can um, decrease the money supply is by raising that rate that they pay on reserves, which causes banks to just want to park their money at the Fed. And um, so there's a whole other discussion on uh, whether or not that's a, uh, a good way to, to handle the matter, but it definitely is a, a way that they can fight inflation by sucking money back in. Now, in terms of the risks, in terms of the different actions that they could take, and, and what if they were to pull all of these levers and forcefully right now, um, so if we were just talking, if Raj and I were just talking about how we think that runaway inflation or stagflation is a less likely scenario, um, well, the bigger risk might in fact be the yield curve inversion. That's something that we talked about last, uh, last month, but it's this general idea that by being a little too hawkish, they could actually tip the uh, economy back toward recession. Uh, I think it's, not a crazy assumption to think that we're sort of closer to the end of the business cycle than the beginning, given that we've been running nine years. Um, and so there is that risk that, um, and that, that by being able to talk is still it. flattening today, isn't it, Praveen? It is. Yeah. Ten year yields have continued to fall. And so the, the, the two year, 10 year spread, or, or even if you want to look at one year, uh, 10 year spread, but either way it continues to tighten. And so that yield curve inversion, as we discussed last month, is a very, very strong indicator of a coming uh, market uh, correction and, uh, and recession. And so that's, uh, that's worth noting. That's, that's sort of a bigger risk. On the being late side, uh, yes, it's possible you could get some commodities inflation. It's absolutely possible you could get some wage inflation. Perhaps, you know, it, looking at the inflation scenario that we're, we're, we've updated today, uh, the idea of inflation getting out of the Fed's control. So then what happens is that the Fed's got to strike double hard if they're late. So that would be the risk there, but that risk in some sense is probably still secondary to the idea of prematurely causing a recession because you're afraid of something that hasn't actually happened yet. So, but these are some of the risks that we're going to explore as we look at the scenarios. Yeah, those commodities inflation and wage inflation, those are also in motion. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, those are some of the things that are happening. All right. Well, let's talk about these new scenarios. We've got the inflation one that's updated and kind of a rejiggering of our oil price scenario, which used to be oil crash. And now we've kind of made it uh, just a more general oil price outlook. OK. Well, you know, just a warning here, the, that advisor that's on the phone. Uh, you know, he he might be reading headline inflation. I think it was 1.9 was the print. And uh, this constant stating of uh, 2% is the target. You know, if you're just careless uh, or just keep on the, that kind of headline news or your Twitter feed, hey, 2% is the tops it's going to go. Don't worry about it. That's not the case as we've seen. So that's one of the reasons that was the invitation uh, invite. If we talk about these scenarios as a summary here, you know, again, it is it is. Uh, you know, I do want to remind the audience that these scenarios are in motion. There is not a good, bad, ugly paradigm. It's ba our baseline scenario is in motion in both cases. Symmetric inflation is where we are right now. And the CPI is two and a half right the second. You know, um, it's yellow. It's not necessarily bad or good. But the S&P uh, has a, you know, the, the baseline rise from that is not going to break or or. Um, uh, make anyone, but that just that the idea that scenario is in motion and it doesn't start today. That's where you know that's why it's our baseline assumption. In terms of the upside from here, if uh, you know as we've seen, U.S. is coming into the picture uh, for to fill Venezuela's shoes. If it does that with Iran long term, then whatever short-lived scenario um, uh, happens with that, you know here those pricing pressures may ease. Maybe um, uh, rents come down just because mark you know supply and demand meet each other whatever that is um, you know you are seeing some corrections in, in big metropolitan areas including San Francisco and New York on rents and so maybe those pricing pressures ease and you know from that we can maintain economic growth um, CPI kind of back in that low um, that very low twos range not two and a half uh, and then if if the Fed you know the Praveen talked about if they're early or late, uh, well, if they're late, you know, that, that kind of leads to a bad scenario and uh, CPI runs up too hot uh, up near in, in the fours um, because of just crazy growth in energy prices. From could be from Iran sanctions, could be from just demand. You know, we are at, uh, nearing highs on demand again, so it could be from a number of reasons. Uh, but as that um, happens, the Fed is unable to, like, control the inflation beast and so then you're, you're looking at um, kind of Bernanke's old nightmare, um, which right. was supposed to be inflation. Okay. Well, and you also you also get the, and, and where does this come from, this idea of, let's say, a 20% correction or something like that? This is also kind of what Greenspan, you know, the, the lead up into 1987, for instance, and that crash in no small part was aggressive rate hikes to try to sort of catch up to what Greenspan was viewing as uh, those kinds of monetary pressures, inflation pressures. And, and so... Um, in the same way, if, if the Fed gets behind, then all of a sudden they're going to have to become more aggressive, and that's going to slow down economic growth. And, um, of course, that degree of rate hike, you know, as we've seen in the past, can lead to uh, a substantial, you know, this is not a world-ending correction by any means, but an actual meaningful one. Right. And GDP slowing down to 1%, uh, I think uh, for a good bit of the, uh, you know, the, the, the aughts, I, they call them, um, you know, from 2010 and now, we did have 1% growth in GDP. Um, so we, we, if people remember what that felt like, it did feel like a recession. Okay, so then the second scenario here on oil prices. Uh, again, good. the baseline scenario is where we are. You know, um, uh, uh, the Cleveland Indians uh, are, are smiling. You know, sweet spot for growth. That's where we are. Between 60 and 70, even at 70, we're, we're doing fine on oil. Producers and consumers happy. And the economy can, can move forward with an oil as a non-issue, with gas as a non-issue. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if, we are, if there is an upside to describe, it would be U.S. moving into the top spot, becoming the old U.S., what we were before the Middle East oil um, discoveries. Uh, and so, you know, oil prices, they're kind of returning down back to 50 bucks. Why? Because that's where shale prices break even, right? That can be, it's much cheaper than digging in the ground for it. And so, you know, the S&P moves up. Why? Because uh, the U.S. GDP is rising, right? We, be we become a supplier to China and India. Uh, and and the opposite of that, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you, you could see a scenario where where long term that U.S. becoming number one exporter still happens. And it's it's due to that short term 
hiccup of Iran sanctions being reimposed, right? There is talk of that giving the red card on this uh, nuclear deal and handing Iran, uh, putting it, putting them back in the jail cell uh, on on selling their oil, right? And so if if there is that kind of thing um, for us, it would probably be a short-term blip uh, on oil prices, kind of like the Venezuela drop that happened uh, earlier this year, just recently wrapped up. And so even a you know 10% correction now now people um, remember what that is because of February March, and so it shouldn't be that bad. But oil prices would skyrocket. $100 is hard to see from here, especially with the you know the kind of uh, support and resistance levels uh, that are multi-year. Uh, in nature at about 80 bucks. That's very hard resistance, you know, $80. We saw it just come down like nothing. And so with that in place, it's really, we can imagine maybe it pierces through that to to lure in um, uh, dumb money to, to bid up oil. But really, we don't even see it cracking 100. It probably never gets there. You know, and that that actually rhymes, Praveen, if you remember in 2008, um, at the bot when uh, when oil, I think it was, Around right now in 2008, that summer before the financial crisis, you know, you had big banks, Goldman Sachs, Nomura, bidding up oil uh, and and hearkening for $200 oil. It never touched 150. And so, you know, all the all the folks on the oil rising, let's say $100 oil, let's see where they are. Uh, you know, will they apologize after it never even touches? Uh, even it doesn't crack triple digits. So that's that. Yes, and and it and it's just less of a. The other thing to note here is that rising oil prices are less of a threat to the U.S. economy than they used to be, because uh, well, as as uh, local domestic production rises, then you've got parts of the United States that benefit on net from higher oil prices, and and so some of that money stays in the domestic economy. So so that's one sort of shock absorber and a reason why it's not as negative to um, U.S. markets as it, it might have been in the past. And then the other aspect of this is that the oil shock, which really, you know, you can look at it that way because oil prices did uh, hit 147 at their high in 08, um, just before the financial crisis. But just that those couple of years prior to the financial crisis when oil prices got really high did spur a lot of um, innovation in the oil sector in terms of drilling, but also increased efficiencies. So across the economy, this is not just about cars and fuel efficiency, but that's gone up too. So across the economy, energy efficiency rises actually uh, at somewhere between, depending on the year, between 2 and 4% a year. And so that rising efficiency is kind of like oil producers' worst nightmare. You don't want your customer to become less dependent on your product, but that's happening over time. And so as that's happening, that just makes it, uh, you know, it's not like cars get 12 miles a gallon like they did in the 70s before the shocks. And, uh, and so that, that makes a difference. One thing I want to say, Praveen, about that oil scenario is I can see both the bad scenario and the good scenario happening. You know, if the the the, the Iran sanctions um, oil impact will be quite short term, right? And so, but if if the U.S. does step into Iran's shoes, there, uh, it's it's almost you know if if they almost might be economically benefited from just import doing the sanctions. So even if they don't want to punish Iran. Uh, politically they don't want to punish them they just want their own economic benefit and the sanctions happen to slot right into that right it's like let me kill your relationship with your customers so i can sell them my oil yeah so well we i, I jumped into hidden levers now to show you just to point out so here we are on the scenario library of course under scenarios up top and uh inflation and oil prices next to each other uh and uh We've got the, of course, the toilet paper roll image and the uh, crying shake. If I drill in, and we'll be dropping the uh, today's slides onto these these decks shortly. So this is actually where you'll find on these scenario pages where you'll one place you'll be able to find the download of of the slides and the the replay of the video. But we can see the new scenario outcomes here: the so pricing pressures ease, symmetric inflation outpaces Fed moves, and uh, and if I hop back to oil prices, we see the three scenarios are called out by dollar value to make it very straightforward to see what is what. The $50 oil, $70 oil, and $90 oil. And uh, there's a couple of additional ones that are kind of more historical in nature, particularly the, the Arab Spring. But these are really the three key scenarios that uh, are, uh, you know, that are uh, updated as of today. 
And if I hit run stress test here, for instance, we can take a look. And I think I've got some, uh, we've got our old uh, robo advisor portfolios in here. Not sure if we have anything else, but uh, we've got a conservative model as well. Okay, so I'll just drop a couple, couple different models in and we can take a look at how they're impacted. And, and you know, this is another one of those interesting scenarios that I think is worth looking at the, the $50 US oil scenario. And I say that because for any of, if any of you have exposure to the energy sector in terms of in model portfolios or in client, uh, you know, clients that have that heavy exposure, it's important because it's this notion that the uh, S&P and the markets can rise while oil is falling, and and you know this this wouldn't be the first time this happened. Actually, back in 2014, when oil prices took a big haircut, if I jump backward, everybody knows that the market, the the stock market, has been rising steadily. But here in 2014, oil prices went from 107 down to around or down to below 50 by the end of the year. And during this crash, at the same time, the S and P was rising, you know, all through that year. So that divergence, it's important to have a modeling tool that I think is sophisticated enough to capture that. Not all of the, the products out there, you know, not all of them will, will show that level of, um, of detail. And so if you have a, an energy holding, then that would, and that would show up. We, we do notice actually, uh, as we end, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of fintech uh, kind of girding toward risk, you know, and that's what happens when you have VC dollars, you chase, you chase whatever is getting popular, DOL one day, uh, account aggregation another day, uh, you know, you probably heard a lot of that before, but just you know, just remember as you as risk becomes cool again uh, in, in the volatility of earlier this year, uh, you know, there's one company that's been concentrating on it for a long time and in the nuanced way it deserves, right? That divergence between S&P and oil prices is probably the biggest story of the 2000, you know, since the financial crisis. That's the real st theme uh, that you'd have to account for as opposed to just blunt proxies or asset classes you know how did those individual securities or um, uh, fixed income streams uh, get impacted whether they're part of the oil patch or not you know we even see it now actually uh, another huge distinction between us let's say and some other stress testing tools including blackrock itself is the idea of upside scenarios right if you click that scenario mm -hmm. library how many of the things, Praveen, that we talk about have ended up being super positive? You know, we've never been doomsday sayers, uh, not to be equated with anything like a, um, a bearishness. We want to be even handed a good, a bad and ugly, just the way the Fed taught us. Right. Uh, in its own stress testing. And so holding that up, we've always shown positive scenarios uh, right alongside. Right. Yeah. Every one of these, yeah. virtually every one of these has, you know, a positive outcome in addition to a more neutral to negative outcome and then a black swan. We always want to cover those tail risks because we know that, of course, that's what you want to do in risk management. But you also want to acknowledge that, yeah, the S&P can go up 20% in a year. It can go up more than that. Uh, you know, so you have bullish scenarios to, to help reflect that and make sure that that's being, um, being captured in your analytics as well. Right. I mean, so some of some of this analysis can be used to say, hey, Mr. Retiring person, you might be taking too risk, too much risk for what suits you. But for the young person that might be there, this same exact tool can be used to tell them you're not taking enough risk. Whatever economic opportunities you're seeing, either through the future of energy or um, the U.S. becoming the number one exporter of oil, you're not you're not grabbing those economic opportunities with whatever vehicles you've chosen. So you know, right. make sure make sure as you use hidden levers, uh, you keep that in mind. I mean, we wouldn't have grown as a as a um, platform during the largest rally of our lives if we weren't able to handle all those things. All right. Well, here we see the takeaways again. Repeat. I I won't read them to you. Uh, 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 I'll just leave them up there for you and see if there's any questions. All right, and we'll follow up with the data, I think, on the tuition that was asked about, you know, some, some more detailed breakdown in terms of CPI. I know that there's some interesting questions about tuition and, and healthcare costs and how that figures into it that uh, we'll, we'll be sure to, uh, to let you guys know about. All right, Praveen, well, great. Uh, you know, we've been having a lot of fun here at Hidden Levers, creating some of the new functionality around 
uh, cash flow analysis, decumulations, uh, scenario bombs being placed into cash flows. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, having a goal centric proposal or more financial planning centric conversation in, in, in your um, using hidden levers, uh, you know, we're not here to replace any financial planning tools, but we are here to work with uh, with them a lot better and project out scenarios into your uh, retirement stream, not just uh, a snapshot of today. So do take a look at cash flows until next month. Uh, have a happy um, have a happy summer and we'll probably see you. Uh, we'll have to cover, uh, I guess, June. Are you expecting a lot of volatility? Um, I mean, it's the World Cup, right? Doesn't everything die, Praveen? Yeah, we'll see. Markets will probably be quiet, but uh, there's always something uh, macro happening that we'll, uh, we'll make sure we get you guys up to date. Well, whatever that is, we'll cover it and more. Thank you, Praveen. My name is Raj. This is Hidden Levers. Thanks for being a subscriber. And if you're not, what are you waiting for? Take care.